Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that all of you had a good lunch. And now we will have a discussion by the name of Hybrid Threats and Resilience. The session would be in Bulgarian and English. Uh, we have uh, two panelists that are online and these gentlemen next to me. Do you hear us? We don't hear you. I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, so Lisa is the first one that uh, can hear us and talk. So uh, let's make a little round uh, for a short self-introduction. And I propose Lisa to start with a few words for her and then uh, Jakob and the guest here. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, sure. uh, my name is Lisa Fast and I'm joining you from Tallinn in Estonia. And I'm the sort of person who populates the space between technology and decision makers quite often, whether it's in impact assessment, the risk management or, or crisis management. Uh, or longer term analysis. Uh, I most recently, I'm the outgoing Chief National Cyber Risk Officer of the Estonian uh, Government Office. And before that, I worked with both the Estonian Cybersecurity Agency as well as the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. And I had the great fortune of spending 2018 and 19 in the United States with the McCain Institute for International Leadership, focusing on how to defend the very infrastructure underlying democracies from cyber attacks and from hybrid threats. Thank you. Jakob? We don't hear you. Nope, we don't hear you still. I can hear Jakob, though, on Zoom. So perhaps it's something uh, with our here. I can also hear you. I'm the interpreter. Okay, until we, we see the technical difficulties, perhaps uh, we can go with uh, Commissioner Dimitrov to, to say a few words for you. My name is Vladimir Dimitrov. I'm head of the Bulgarian Cybercrime Unit within the General Directorate for Countering Organized Crime in Bulgarian Ministry of Interior. Um, I am a police officer for the last 17 years, and I'm dealing right now with a large variety of cyber crimes, cooperation with our partners from different law enforcement agencies and private sector. Thank you. Jakob. Yeah, but the stage looks still confused. The stage is not hearing him. <laughs> Strange. Uh, I can hear him, but the stage doesn't hear you for some reason. Okay, so perhaps... So also. while... Yeah. Hi, everyone. While we're trying to figure out what's going on with Jakob's microphone, my name is uh, Radoslav Rizov. I'm leading the public sector at Telling Business Services for the past 10 years. I've been working in public sector um, in technology domain. Uh, I'm keen on cybersecurity and everything that goes around this topic. Okay, and uh, until we manage to, to get... Uh, I, I'm going to, to make just uh, one introduction to Jakob and then continue further. He is the head of public uh, policy for Poland, Baltics, Romania and Bulgaria uh, in Facebook. So enjoying his uh, feedback from uh, Facebook and the, I think the biggest social media uh, that we, we have uh, at the moment. Uh, my name is uh, Bujan Janchev. I'm a Chief Technology Officer at Lyrex BS, which is a managed service and information security company uh, in the region, but also delivering services worldwide. And I'll be uh, moderating the panel today. Uh, we will try to, to do it as a discussion, not to go on the, uh, with speech of uh, each single uh, panelist at the moment. And so we have several topics uh, to cover. Uh, it will be good if we manage to get in these uh, 50 minutes as a time. 
Uh, first of all, uh, my first question is going to be something related to the, to the elections and uh, the malicious cyber operations that we see around such kind of uh, elections and what is the, the way to determine such kind of uh, attack and uh, how we react as a, at, at overall. So, as Estonia is, uh, let's say, in, the, in Europe, uh, most advanced or one of the countries that's most advanced in these uh, situations, uh, my proposal is to start with Lisa to share uh, her thoughts on, on that one. Thank you. And there couldn't really be a more timely discussion given that we're you know, the day after the first US presidential debate uh, that highlights these underlying democratic infrastructure issues. And what we've seen with elections is that, of course, the most detrimental attackers are those that are government-backed. And there's clear evidence of several campaigns that are controlled by, or at least very clearly ordered by, if not carried out by the members of uh, Russian uh, security services, in particular the cyber branch of GRU, the military foreign intelligence. Uh, we saw that already in 2014 in Ukraine, uh, in a case where those of you who might not remember it, uh, there seemed to have been uh, a very, you know, an attempt to deface the, and the successful attempt to deface the website of the Central Elections Commission on the evening of elections, as if 2014 Ukraine wasn't already tumultuous enough, showing a marginal candidate, uh, Dmitry Yarosh, coming up as the winner of the first round with you know, a 37% of the vote. In fact, Mr. Yarosh won a slightly less impressive 0.7% of the votes and an 11th place. And then, of course, the case of 2016 and the cyber attacks against candidates and their campaigns, most notably Hillary Clinton, the steel and leak, uh, but also Emmanuel Macron, who managed to build better resilience, whose campaign built better resilience don't need to be explained that much more. But of course, at the same time, there have been attacks against uh, election organizers, vendors, the supply chain of election technology. And, and frankly, what seems to be the adversarial behavior behind it is up until this year, seems to have been to just delegitimize democratic institutions, the procedures underlying elections. There doesn't seem to have been a very clear preference for one candidate or another. What seems to have changed, and I'd be very interested to hear what Jakob and his first hand experience at Facebook is really speaks to it. It seems, and the reports that are public suggest that in 2020, that's no longer the case. It's no longer the attacker throwing spaghetti at the wall to be able to say your wall is dirty and seeing what sticks across information operations, human-led uh, operations, as well as cyber attacks and th data theft. It now seems to be more targeted, Twitter and Facebook themselves, together with a uh, with the U.S. intelligence community reported that a few weeks ago. And it seems to be more targeted and cleverer, in particular in the U.S., to undermine uh, Joe Biden. Now, at the same time, uh, in being that opportunistic, you know, and without getting into the discussion of why the definition of a hybrid, hybrid threat rather than integrated operations might not be best in this situation. It's an academic discussion that might require a few drinks before 
in, in this very esteemed uh, group of uh, panelists. But it's clear that the attackers with great flexibility and agility are moving between these different types of operations. So after 2016, it was clear that information, that uh, cybersecurity will be bolstered uh, in terms of trainings of candidates and parties in terms of cybersecurity of election organizers, more transparency in the supply chain and more testing of the technology itself, both in terms of security and functionality testing. Uh, so as that was clear, the adversary seems to have shifted more towards the information operations. So it's clear that the adversary is still very much going for the lowest hanging fruit. Whatever works most effectively. And as we've shifted the adversarial calculation, cost-benefit calculation away from cybersecurity, it's now shifted to better targeted and cleverer information operations. Uh, but as they're still seeking to undermine democracies, it's also clear that where they've succeeded to draw out existing cleavages in society, to create opposition, alienation from politics, from elections, from governance as such, there the adversary is sitting back and relaxing because the alienation, those cleavages have become canyons within our own democratic societies where there's lack of trust, there's lack of civilized debate, where, you know, civil unrest moved on to the debate stage of presidential elections of the wealthiest nation of the world last night. Uh, so if we're punching ourselves in the face, the adversary needs to just every once in a while give a little push. And those pushes have become more sophisticated. They're better targeted and cleverer. But at this point, a lot of what's wrong about democracies and the way up to elections we're doing to ourselves. Jakob, do you hear us? Or can we hear you? So Lisa was mentioning uh, the role of Facebook and social ne uh, networking uh, in the, into the elections. So it would be good if, if you can share with us a few thoughts about that. Yeah, yeah, but it seems like Sofia still doesn't. Yep. Okay, let's hope. Feedback from the organizers about what I should potentially do. So. Jakob, we hear you, so... Uh, oh, you hear me? Yes, now we hear here. So, this is it possible is to see a few words for you and uh, how do you see the, the social yes. network? So, yeah. I'm super happy we managed to solve these technical issues. Uh, hoping it was not a cyber attack. Um, so yes, my name is Jacob. Um, I um, lead the public policy efforts for Facebook in a bunch of countries in the, in the region indeed, uh, including, uh, well, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania and Bulgaria. And maybe not to waste more time and to go directly to your question, well, obviously, you know, protecting the integrity of the elections while also preserving freedom of expression is a top priority for Facebook. And I think it's fair to say that using lessons from the past and input also from experts and policymakers across all the political spectrum, uh, we've made substantial investments in teams and technologies to better secure the elections all over the world. And we now have more than 35,000 people around the world working on safety and security. And their job is to monitor uh, for yeah, suspicious activity uh, and quickly identify uh, suspicious behavior content uh, that violates our policies and remove if, if needed. Now, our strategy to protect the elections clearly not apply uh, only in critical times, like a few months before the elections. It's really a year-round effort. And it's centered on what I'd call three kind of distinguished areas. 
Um, the first one is about preventing interference. The second is really related to content as such. So all the kind of harmful content that we remove, uh, the misinformation for which we reduce the, 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 the spread. And the third one is the transparency, the transparency that users get about why they see stuff on their, on their newsfeed. Now, with regards to the first topic, with regards to preventing interference, a key part of our strategy is to prevent interference in working with government authorities, law enforcement, um, security experts, civil society, and other tech companies to stop emerging threats by precisely establishing a direct line of communication, uh, sharing knowledge and identifying opportunities for collaboration. And collaboration we had, for instance, with the Estonian government ahead of the elections, the, the last general elections, was a great example. Uh, was many meetings with, uh, um, with all the uh, agencies on the ground uh, to, to, to better, to exchange, really to exchange uh, the different informations that we had uh, to better spot, find, uh, and remove the, uh, the threats that uh, exist um, online. Now, the second key aspect uh, is about content as such. And here we apply a three-part strategy, which is remove, reduce, and inform. This involves removing content that violates our policies, reducing the spread of problematic content that does not violate our policies, but still undermines the kind of authenticity of the platform, and then informing our users. Now, we remove content that violates our community standards, including fake accounts um, and accounts that engage in inauthentic behavior, misinformation that may contribute to a direct risk or harm for our users, voter fraud or interference, and obviously hate speech, bullying, harassment. Um, and we also remove ads that do not comply with our ads policies, which is super important in the context of political ads. Now, we also reduce uh, the, 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 the reach of a lot of content. Uh, some problematic content that does not meet the standards for removal under our community standards, but still undermines, uh, again, the authenticity on the platform, such as, uh, for instance, misinformation or content that has been assessed as misinformation by our third party fact checker. Uh, for this content, first, we, we flag it as, uh, as misinformation, but most importantly, we reduce uh, the reach of this content by up to 80% so that users have less access to, um, to, 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 to fake news on the, on the platform. So there's a lot of tools that we develop, that we have been developing, that we will be developing in the future. But then the third aspect, the information aspect, is absolutely crucial. I mean, I always say that we may have the best tools ever and, you know, it is an arms race and we are definitely running the race and we're trying to catch the bad guys. But if there is no education among the voters, uh, among the users in the society about a wise usage of the internet, if there's no media literacy um, so that people by themselves to some extent can also spot when they see uh, a, a fake news in front of them, then I guess this battle will never be really won. So this education aspect is absolutely crucial. And ahead of every major election, we, we kind of contribute to this effort, uh, organizing massive uh, media literacy campaigns on our platform to inspire our users for every each of them to become some sort of fact checker uh, and really analyze the, the, the content that they, that they see. Now, last but not least, there is the, from my perspective, crucial element of transparency. Uh, political ads do exist. They do exist in every media. Uh, but I think it's extremely important and fair to our users to uh, give clear information who has posted the ad, who has paid for the ad, and how the ad has been targeted. This is a whole process that, we've been that we have implemented in Europe before the, uh, the last EU parliamentary elections. Uh, and today, uh, indeed, to run a political or issue ad on our platform, 
uh, first of all, we have to check uh, who is the person who is sending the ad and if indeed this person is in the country where the ad is targeted to uh, fight with foreign interference, for instance. Um, and then once the ad is accepted, uh, it goes into an archive library uh, accessible for every user uh, where everybody can check, um, again, uh, the budget, the target group, and so on and so forth. Um, this is, has been a, a massive effort, and I really think that, um, I, you know, transparency obviously is a journey, and I guess we're not there yet. But this is really a huge, huge step um, towards a better informing our users of what they see and why they see things on their, on their newsfeed. So that would be uh, kind of a word intro on my side, but happy to further discuss, of course. Thank you. Uh, actually, I, I was thinking of a uh, few of the things that you mentioned, that the social content and some st stuff related to the ident identity of the, of the guys. And uh, I'll switch to Bulgarian uh, so, uh, for, for, some, for some things. Um, Искам да споделя с вас, че всъщност базирайки се на социалния контент и базирайки се на опита, който ние Based on social content and the based on audit, we see organizations being attacked in Bulgaria and a major part of cyber crime goes in a similar direction and Commissioner Dimitrov can share some of his experiences from cyber crime in Bulgaria. Can you hear me? My name is Vladimir Dimitrov. I had a department uh, cyber security in the department for fighting organized crime under the Ministry of Interior. This is, I've been on the position for 20 days only. And 11 years I uh, was an employee of the same department involved in, in investigating cyber attacks. And before that I was a policeman in the regional department. I was involved in uh, severe crime investigations. We have more than 40 people in our cyber security, cyber crime department, and it's a, a wide uh, range of cyber crime that we investigate. We have accumulated a veritable potential and people who have specific knowledge, our colleagues have specific knowledge about cyberspace and which uh, the key types of cyber crime are. And so what is uh, the most effective way to uh, persecute them. What we see is a weird uh, crime, a sophisticated one, it's called business email compromise, is the English term. Business email compromise was a term of uh, 15 years ago. It was imposed by, put into circulation by the FBI. It is uh, a continuous, sophisticated crime committed by groups from North Africa. Everything starts with a phishing email to an employee. It usually informs uh, the employee that there's a problem with the email and he should go to a link in order to have the problem addressed. And then the employee of a Bulgarian company, in this concrete, concrete example, uh, is uh, referred to a compromised website, and employees are invited to visit uh, a phishing, uh, provisional phishing site and uh, use the password because they know the username but they don't know the password. And this is how organized groups learn the 
записват съдържано в тази почтенска кутия и започват изключително внимателно да процесите в постбокс и имейл бокс и те стават мониторинг the operations of the company if it's a matter of payments with between the business and its customers and then they replace an email an authentic email to uh, with an email to the uh, employee giving some data details uh, where a payment should be directed. And they use various uh, pretexts for changing, for substituting a bank account. And very often, they, recently, they have used problems that banks have related to the pandemic. And a Bulgarian employer might be sent a new email with an invoice uh, with changed bank details and with an invitation to wire the money to this new account. This is how uh, we get those complaints from companies almost every week. And the damage done to Bulgarian businesses uh, through the compromising of business email amount to millions. One week, for instance, we have a Bulgarian company which was uh, defrauded into sending 50,000 euro to this fake bank account. Uh, then another week we have a company uh, they wired 100,000 euro or even 1 million. It is, it's been a regular problem with Bulgarian businesses suffering from this, and the overall amount adds up to millions. North African organized crime groups uh, then have to launder the money. They use the services um, of other criminal organizations who are uh, solely involved in money laundering. Uh, they usually done at uh, closed uh, hacker forums or cryptic uh, communication channels. This is how they communicate. The money laundering group uh, communicate with business email compromise groups. They provide them with the bank number and the name of the receiver. They have uh, financial mules, they have networks of mules uh, all over the world. It's a network covering the whole world. Uh, we have financial mules in Bulgaria as well. They have been recruited by people in uh, the middle and uh, higher uh, ranks of uh, these organized transnational groups, money laundering groups. The money launderers don't, uh, they uh, carry out no computer crime. What they do is money laundering from any kind of criminal activity. The executives of these groups, they provide jobber accounts. And this is a deal, and there are many details to be specified. Uh, they typically would ask uh, the guy who wants to have his money laundered what kind of account they need, uh, in what kind of country, which part of the world. If the Bulgarian company is, uh, has a customer or a supplier from China, uh, usually these money launderers, they can provide the North uh, African business email compromisers, they provide them with accounts from China, from Hong Kong, or anywhere close to China, so that the Bulgarian company is duped into believing that this is a legitimate bank account. Once again, business email compromise is a grave issue, and Bulgarian businesses uh, fall victim to this kind of crime every week. Every week, every second week, we have a Bulgarian business who has been 
uh, robbed of uh, 50 or hundreds of thousands of uh, lev or euro. Uh, sometimes once a year it happens that it might amount to a million. Another area where we uh, carry out quite a lot of law enforcement is internet uh, fraud. The most typical case is a Bulgarian finding a car, a second-hand car, with, at a very good price, and then they communicate through emails or through some application to purchase the car uh, and the, the the seller would supply the car to deliver the car to Bulgaria, but uh, there comes um, they come to a point where he gets an email from a transport company saying that, that your car has been loaded and here is a photo, but we need the reference number from the bank. Uh, and so, though well negotiated the deal, uh, they had an arrangement to pay the car upon arrival. Uh, finally, the Bulgarian pays even the final price to a bank account in a European country, typically, and he sends the, sends the documents that he wired the money. A couple of weeks later, he gets an email that the truck uh, had a, a crash uh, somewhere, an accident somewhere, and he needs to send some more money. And we regularly get complaints for this kind of crime. Uh, perhaps you can share uh, what do you see in the government and private organization that working together in the, in the cyber crime and in the elections and how we uh, can uh, see and mitigate risk and attacks and how do you see that one? Yeah, I'm gonna switch again back to English. Uh, I'm gonna try to make some parallel between the discussions that we already made. We see that uh, the cyber attacks are getting more and more complex, um, but uh, in my opinion we should not only focus on the technological level, we should also pay attention to the policy one. And uh, a couple of years ago um, one of the big corporations has launched an uh, initiative called uh, Digital Geneva Convention. The idea behind the Digital Geneva Convention was to establish a common set of rules and regulations that will basically ban states from conducting or financing uh, groups that are conducting cyber attacks. Ever, ever since that moment, I have uh, made a lot of research on the topic and I firmly believe that this is a way uh, that many states and private organizations may cooperate on a global level to achieve coherence in terms of uh, policy. What we are witnessing is that in the international law there are some grey areas that currently exist and many countries are taking advantage in these grey areas, perform and conduct cyber attacks and get away with nothing. So if we want to align our legal framework, I think that we should work on a kind of a digital Geneva Convention or however we call it. In an essence, uh, we may also base it on the Tallinn manuals. We have a representative from Estonia. Lisa may also reiterate on that topic if she has been uh, researching on it or Jacob. Uh, and we may take a step further by introducing a neutral body that will investigate and arbitrate such uh, cyber attacks in order to basically take proactive measures and to protect all citizens who are currently at the forefront. We are the ones who are at the forefront of the cyber attacks and the cyber wars that are currently happening. Um, and so, yeah, um, I, I can go a little bit further if, if necessary, but my opinion is that this will go through a, some sort of a policy uh, discussion on a global scale and a, a great policy uh, topic that um, all, mem all states and all private organizations will contribute to. Even the, the citizens should be actively cooperating and participating in that process 
which basically will guarantee that there is no private or public interest prevailing while they are drafting the um, regulation or the um, articles in this digital Geneva Convention. Yeah, thank you. J uh, Jacob, perhaps you can share if Facebook is uh, supporting the Digital G Geneva Convention or if you are aware of that one, or perhaps it's more onto the regulation at European level that we have to achieve uh, before that one. Well, so a few, a few things. F first of all, um, I think it's fair to say that there are a lot of uh, aspects of this debate that are out of the loop of any kind of regulation. And it may not be the best thing ever. And it's been quite some time that uh, we as Facebook call, for instance, with regards to, again, elections and with regards to elections integrity, um, to have a more uniform and future-proof regulation. Um, so that democratically elected uh, people can uh, tell, you know, the tech companies and all the actors in the, in the digital area uh, how to behave and where to go. And from this perspective, I do think that uh, there is a lot going on in Brussels. There is a, a, a lot of good things going on in Brussels. The, the, the main thing is really the debate about the European Democracy Action Plan um, that is now ongoing. And we do believe and understand that it is really a first step before some concrete um, regulation propositions um, you know, will be proposed next year. Now, as policymakers kind of decide uh, on the appropriate measures to tackle um, the, the, the issue of the elections integrity and disinformation, uh, it is important that definitions used are clear are precise uh, to ensure rules and regulations as well than uh, the, as the enforcement of, of these rules to really be uh, fit for purpose. Uh, and from our perspective, for instance, um, we would definitely call for some level of regulation with regards, for instance, to the um, um, political advertising uh, that includes a great uh, transparency for all that is you know, relates to contributions, to ad spendings, and a clear definition about what a political ad is. This is not clear today in the different uh, European countries. And in the different European countries, the definition is different, which is also some sort of an issue in the way we, we approach our work. Um, so, yes, we definitely call for uh, more cooperation and regulation with decision makers. Now, what is important is to really uh, kind of insist on the real issues, uh, not focusing on, on things where, where we should not focus. And for instance, this, inf this information as such, um, I really don't think that it would be a good idea uh, to try to define from a regulatory perspective what a fake news is and, and to try to regulate it. Um, but on the other hand, again, there is really a lot of fields where a lot can, should be done um, with the kind of green light of democratically uh, elected uh, people. To, to snowball on that, I can only agree with Jakob that regulating content is, is not the way to go. And it's not the way to go because in a democratic society, frankly, I as a citizen, I have a constitutional right to lie. Exactly. Exactly. I, mean, I don't have a constitutional right to harm others and to deceive others, but I can lie in terms of fiction, in terms of... No, I can lie. So that's not the issue. But going back to the more fundamental issues here, the international law is clear. Uh, you know, international law applies to cyberspace, both during war and during peacetime. The Talon Manual already was, was mentioned, the Talon Manual on the applicability of international law to cyberspace, uh, and that is currently the best practice or state of the art of expert opinion of legal, global legal advisors on how it applies across the world. NATO also has made it clear that 
No, cyberspace is the domain of operations for NATO, next to land, sea, and the air. And that, most importantly for, for allies, that cyber, that collective defense also applies in cyberspace. And that you do not have to respond in kind. So if a cyber attack was up to Article 4 and 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty threshold. In other words, if there was you know, death, destruction of property or so on, it also calls for an Article 4 or 5 response. That's, so that's all already in place. But moving on to a digital Geneva Convention, uh, that whilst ideal, is not a realistic plan for two reasons. One of them is that international corporations do not make law. No, Facebook doesn't make law, international law, uh, and Microsoft does not make international law. Nations and bodies compiled of nations make international law. So, a Microsoft started initiative, while it's great for discussion and public relations, does not create international norms, and it cannot create international norms. That would be an upheaval of international rules and norm creation, as we know it in a post-Second World War world, which perhaps is not optimal for those who are rules, rules and rule of law-based societies. So there have been attempts to create international norms most that are global in nature, most notably the UN processes, including the UN Group of Governmental Experts, the UNGG. And those have epically broken down, frankly. Uh, there have been walkouts, there have been, you know, yelling across each other, at each other across uh, tables. So it is quite clear that nations are not at the point where they can create a digital Geneva Convention. And frankly, neither, you know, if we're looking for something that's parallel to arms control, that happened through decades. It didn't happen through over the course of years. Uh, so for me, it's clear that right now the question is really state practice and shared practice of regional or like-minded nations. Uh, you know, we're still at a point where threat intelligence sharing across borders in real time or close to real time so that it's actionable in terms of cyber operations is problematic at best. Uh, we're still at the time where most cross-border cyber crime incidents do not get investigated because they're out of jurisdiction of the victim, victims, national police forces uh, jurisdiction. So we're really at the point where regional cooperation is most that we can hope for, both in terms of norm and practice creation in terms of practical operational cooperation. And, and for that, I'm very much looking at EU, frankly, more so than at NATO. NATO is a, is a defense organization. Digital security, cybersecurity of our digital lifestyles is a way of life question. And whilst the EU has made great strides in terms of the Network and Information Security Directive, GDPR, the Digital Services Act. Uh, it's also clear that it's not really taken full advantage of the power of a union to be a partner for the likes of Microsoft and Facebook and so on. To really, instead of you know, markets of 1 to 80 million, which is the population of member states, Mm. Instead of, you know, and that's a tough negotiation position for a global corporation. 
instead to negotiate with Facebook, with Microsoft, with Google, with Amazon, with the tech giants as a block that sets standards, that sets you know, certification frameworks, and that sets a clear threshold of what is okay and what isn't. And that for me is you know, the most that I could dream for in terms of creating state practice that's more than one government. And then secondly, really, it's the question of even bilateral operational cooperation in Europe, you know, doing what Five Eyes does for the societies we live in. Thank you. I think that uh, our time is, is over and uh, we don't have enough time for, for questions, but really uh, Radu was wanting to, to raise another topic here on our a comment, but I think that such kind of discussion uh, uh, may, t may take a long and I'm very glad that uh, uh, we, instead of uh, having a lot of earlier timing, to that we have many living for 50 minutes and I, I believe we can talk one hour more even on, on, that, on that matter. I really appreciate uh, the, your join, remote joining and uh, perhaps next time is going to be good uh, in person to be because these events, one of the great added value for them is the social networking and the, the networking between the people, between the experts, uh, become, uh, governments and IT and information security experts and business organizations. So thank you for, uh, for your uh, remote joining and for you for uh, for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you, Boyan. Yes, the next uh, panelist is uh, uh, Martin from Soul Cyber, and he is going to f make for you a demo. Yes. Yep.